So I'm delighted today to introduce my friend and colleague, Nigam Shah. Uh, we are especially delighted that he just uh, became a co-director of our Amy Center and have the benefit of his insight and wisdom as we expand our mission to encompass not just imaging, but all forms of data and uh, all uh, interesting problems that could be solved by AI. So Nigam uh, did his training in his medical training in India uh, and then did a PhD at Penn State University, came to Stanford for his postdoc and then has rapidly risen through the ranks to the point where he is now a tenured professor of medicine and biomedical informatics. He also serves as our associate dean for research and uh, for the healthcare enterprise, he is the associate CIO, chief information officer for data science. He's a leader in our BMI graduate program, as well as our clinical informatics fellowship. Uh, Nigam's research focuses on combining machine learning and prior knowledge in medical ontologies to enable the learning health system. He's been elected to the American College of Medical Informatics and the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Uh, he's a creative researcher, fantastic collaborator. We're very happy he's here today, and he's going to be talking about a framework for making predictive models useful in practice. So Nigam, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for the, <clears throat> for the glowing intro. Uh, and I want to do this very collaborative and interactively. And uh, feel free to interrupt. And uh, I'm going to start screen sharing in a slightly different way. Uh, hold on. This, this is not what I expected. Uh, and I'll arrange things so that I should be able to see everybody and also uh, pay attention to chat while I am presenting. So give me just a second. You should be seeing my screen very soon. Yes, we see your uh, slides. Yep, in, in non-presentation mode. Correct. And then arrange this panel. The, funny, the, the bad thing is I can't do this arrangement before I start screen sharing. So unfortunately, I have to use a minute of time here to set up my classroom, so to speak. <laughs> All right, and now open my chat. So if anyone messages me, I can see that as well. Perfect. I can All right. help so you All monitor set. the chat too, Nigam. All right, so yes, you should be seeing my uh, yep. full screen slides now. And I see uh, 25 of you besides me on here, so perfect. If you wanna keep video open, if you're in a surrounding where you can, please do so. So I get visual feedback in terms of uh, am, how many people I'm losing along the way as I speak. <laughs> I try not to lose more than 30% of my audience, but we'll see how that goes. All right. And feel free to raise your hand or, uh, you know, uh, put something in the chat. And then uh, the goal is to have a conversation. And so this is a journal club. I'm going to, go, going to focus primarily on one paper. Uh, but before I launch into that, I want to give a little bit of context on where I'm coming from. And then I'll also include some context on what led us to this particular uh, problem that uh, we're addressing. So first things first, this is the fabulous group that makes all of this happen. Uh, without this team, I probably wouldn't be standing here. And then of course, funding from a variety of sources. The work that we're gonna be uh, focusing on today is uh, primarily led by this person here, Kenneth Jung uh, in the back row in the center. And then, of course, involvement from a lot of other people uh, in the team as well. And then Kurt already introduced this. Uh, I have two institutional hats and I spend about 55% you know, of my time as a faculty member uh, doing research projects with students, uh, you know, teaching classes and so on. And what I'm going to talk to you about comes from this particular effort, which was a a stream, a work stream in the Department of Medicine and now very closely aligned. You could also think of it as merged with the Amy Center. The, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that the research that happens here is informed by the institutional roles and that gives a very different way of looking at problems. That's sort of the gist of it here. Okay, so zooming out to like 50,000 feet or 100,000 feet, you know, pick your favorite altitude. Uh, the the way I think of, of data is in this patient journey sense. So on, on screen right now from left to right is a fictional patient timeline with the red dots is when something of consequence happens. 
And depending on where you are in the healthcare ecosystem, uh, you definitely get a bill. And so there's medical claims. Um, there will be codes, medication, procedure records, lab tests, and their results, presumably, clinical documents, bedside monitors, variables, gene expression or molecular data of other form, phone usage, browsing history, social media, audio recordings, and so on. And obviously, you know, this audience will notice a, a major gap here. I didn't say images, because I don't know much about images. Everything I know about pictures is from Kurt and Matt. Uh, so I, uh, but we have started a few projects together, so I, I will add images here. The point here is, if you imagine these things as tracks of information, the key point is there's probably you know, 50, maybe 70 tracks of information you could get your hands on for about a particular individual. But two things remain true. There is no entity that has a complete track on a person. And there is no entity that has all tracks on one person. So this thing, I'm gonna call this the patient timeline object is fragmented both over time and across modalities. And sort of a key notion uh, that I have found very helpful uh, in, uh, in thinking about how problems are set up and so on. So I've been working with about 200 million such patient timelines, roughly spanning eight to 10 years, mostly limiting to sort of this portion of the tracks of information We've done some really wacky projects around phone usage and browsing history, uh, which we'll leave for some another day. The point here is that we use this patient timeline object to do two things, which is to either do some risk stratification that guides the decision of whether to act or to do some inference that tells us how to act. Now, I granted this is an oversimplification, obviously, um, but it, it helps to have this worldview that we're going to be using these multiple data modalities in order to come up with a number that is going to be used by a clinician or a patient to decide, should I do something? You can imagine the Oncotype DX test that looks at a whole bunch of molecular markers and gives you a number which if it is above 26, you're at high risk and you should have aggressive treatment, for example. And you can imagine sort of the simple things we have in medicine, like the Glasgow comma scale, the Abgar score, or the pooled cohort equations for ASCVD risk, all of them as instances of doing some sort of stratification, either classification or prediction that tells us what to do, or that, that tells us whether we should do something. And then there's a smaller body of work and smaller in this and you know, roughly 70, 30 split between these two uh, where we want to learn from the prior experience to guide what should the patient, uh, what should the doctor or the patient do? And that's sort of this guiding the choice of how to act. It requires causal inference. For a couple of years ago, saying the word causal inference was taboo. Uh, in medical writing, it's uh, very easy to get into trouble by saying the word inference as opposed to association if you're writing a JAMA article or something. Uh, so these two activities kind of map to the two main projects in my team. Uh, and this particular one about uh, improving quality of care using machine learning is what we're going to focus on today. And then on the guiding the choice uh, side, there's this other project we just included in my team where we basically produce a bedside report of what happened to similar patients. All right, I'm gonna skip this one. So let's dive into the paper. <clears throat> the only reason this slide existed is this is the funding mechanism that makes the work possible. So in that sense, it's one of the most important slides but doesn't have much uh, uh, scientific content on there. So this is the paper, here's the URL. Ken Jung is the first author and Going back here, it sort of fits into this research on utility assessment and system effects of having a machine learning solution. Uh, a little bit on safety. We actually did work on ethics, but that's not part of this paper. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about it today. Okay. 
So I'm going to do the paper in reverse. So what I will show you are figures directly from the publication, but I'm going to start with the last figure, which is a high level view, and then we'll build it and, and, and zoom into the specific instance. So this high level view is this having a notion of a delivery science for machine learning solutions. So what do I mean by that? So for the purpose of this argument, for this conversation, let's pretend that a machine learning solution is an equation of some sort. You have a bunch of features, let's call them a vector of X's, which you want to map to a outcome variable, Y, either a quantity, uh, either a, a numeric uh, output, in which, which case we do a regression or uh, a binary classification. And so a lot of work used to begin or still begins with learning that equation. And one of the key points we make in this publication, and we're not the only ones, there's probably five other papers like this, is that the first step instead should be to ask a few questions. So for example, if I have a prediction on who is gonna be at risk for a heart attack, what action is someone going to take? So to put a, use a very beaten down example, um, if the, AS, the major adverse cardiovascular event risk over 10 years is above 7.5, according to the pool cohort equations, we would prescribe a stat. And in every clinical discipline, you can come up with some sort of situation where given a prediction, you would or would not do something. And so if you're trying to build a predictive model, say for fall prevention in the hospital, the question to ask is, given the probability of the patient falling, what are you going to do? Do you have the capacity to take that action. How many actions can you take? How many people do you have on staff? How many of these actions can you do in a day? Those kinds of things. And in parallel, we also want to ask the question about the model formulation, which is about, should we use an existing model, existing equation, or do we need to really learn a new one? And I can't stress this point more. <clears throat> I'll just give you a, a sort of a shock and awe number. If you look at the number of publications on clinical risk scoring systems, there's 250,000 of them, and that's still 2015. 250,000. So if 90% of people were just doing sort of team science and evaluating somebody else's work uh, and just reproducibility checking, we still have 25,000 risk scores. And I see some clinicians on the call, like how many risk scores do you use on a daily basis? Five, maybe, maybe three. So if you can think of building a model, there's a very high chance somebody somewhere has built one already. So let's say we go through that loop and we convince ourselves that a new model has to be built. Next comes the fun part. This is where a lot of people spend time. This is where a lot of computer scientists begin their foray into healthcare is to try to build a new model. And there the goal is to get the best equation that matches the inputs to the output or the, the classification label. We wanna make sure that that function is fair. Uh, you know, in the last couple of years, there's a lot of conversation about that. But at this point, I also worry about practical feasibility can I get the data in time? Because if I have to make the prediction by 7 a.m., I need the data by 6 a.m. Uh, and given my feature space and given the idiosyncrasies of the IT setup at the particular location, will I be able to move those bits and bytes around in time in order to run inference? And surprisingly, that turns out to be a non-trivial problem, at least as of today. And uh, a lot of sort of, you know, in general communication, you know, people will say the EMR. Well, there's no one thing as the EMR. I mean, the hospital has an electronic medical record system, you know, Epic, Cerner, and the likes, but there's probably 90 other IT systems that also contain patient data in electronic form in some sense. And so they also, in my mind, span the universe of EMRs. All right, so if, the, if practical feasibility is possible, then we would want to go to the next step where we again do some pen and paper or a simulation, a uh, thought experiment that says, given the costs of the actions we're going to take, either the monetary cost, either the time it takes, either the people it requires, basically resources are consumed 
if, you, if we choose to take some action. So given those resource consumptions, I'm using cost not just in the dollar sense. Is there gonna be net benefit in terms of better quality of care? Quantified as disability adjusted life years prevented, lower cost, higher patient satisfaction, less complication rates, whatever. But there has to be some net benefit. And alongside, we also need to take another hard look at work capacity and say, how much of this potential net benefit are we able to realize? Because there might be a lot of net benefit, but if we can't follow through, there's, we're not gonna capture most of, mo a lot of, most of it. And then finally comes the stage where we've convinced ourselves that yes, it's worth preventing, you know, uh, uh, predicting falls and based on the model's prediction, it's worth doing something and having a, uh, an assistant that continuously shadows the patient or whatnot. And we deploy the model, we need to babysit it, make sure it's working every day, not throwing errors and so on. But uh, we also need to do an honest prospective evaluation that by making this new work system that is triggered by a model, have we improved whatever we were going to improve? Because otherwise, we're just making healthcare more complex and more expensive. So that's sort of the gist of it. And we present this as a four stage framework and the, the work we did for using a classifier to improve advanced care planning is an instantiation uh, of this particular uh, uh, framework. And there's a separate paper on the, this framework as well. Okay, all right, so need to take one more slide of detour in, a, in, in terms of a history lesson because I've, I've said the word net benefit, I've even said the word utility, but I haven't quite crisply quantified it. So let's uh, spend a minute on that. <clears throat> so what we're looking on screen here uh, on the left is a little two by two table. The columns are truth. The rows are what the model tells us. Um, and on the right is uh, an, an empty uh, auto C plot right now with just a true positive rate plot against the false positive rate. <clears throat> so if for every cell in this table, if we knew the true positive rate that our model is going to have, if we knew the baseline rate of the positives, in this example, let's say 5%, and then we knew this magic number, this UTP, which is the utility of taking action on a false positive. As in, if I allocate a human being to prevent falls, how effective are they in preventing falls? Measured in terms of dollars or falls prevented or whatever is, is, is your... Uh, way of quantifying utility. So that would give us this little equation. It's just, you know, arithmetic and moving words and terms around. Uh, just ignore that for a second. Uh, animation is a bit out of order. Okay. I can move these terms around and then I can get the slope. And that what slope is telling me is that the rate of these lines, which I'll go to in a second, depends on the rate of the false, uh, the rate of the negatives or positives and the difference between the utilities, which in English, is the rate of the negatives times the cost of getting that wrong divided by the rate of the positives times the cost of getting those wrong. So that's the intuition. Like that's what we really care about, the slope. So where does that slope play out? So I'm gonna rewind the animation for a bit. <clears throat> okay, so this particular red line I'm saying passes through here, as in I have 100% false positives, 100% uh, <clears throat> uh, true positives. Basically, I'm taking action on everybody. And so that's act on every case. In those values, I can then solve and find all other values of true positive rate and false positive rate at which I would get the same utility. And so that's this, this one line, this red line. I can make that exact same line by saying, I'm saying it needs to pass through zero, meaning I'm gonna do nothing. I'm not gonna have any false positives, but I'm not gonna have any true positives either. And you can solve that line that gives you the, the yellow line. And then uh, the, the gray is our receiver operator curve of the model. Now, if we pick a good operating spot, we can have a line that passes through that. This line, depending on the community is called the indifference line 
or uh, this is another as well, which I'm blanking on. But the point is that a model is only going to be useful in the zones where this particular line we could have created by a fixed rule. So the red and yellow lines are a fixed rule. And let's say I could have another fixed rule that says take action on every third person. And that passes through here. Taking, taking action based on the model is only useful if the receiver operator curve crosses over, jumps over this indifference line. Turns out that this core intuition about indifference lines was in the paper that introduced receiver operator curves to, to, to the world in 1946 or something like that. I think it's equation 46, and we kind of forgot about it. The economists uh, rediscovered it in the 80s. Uh, the other communities have also derived the same notion. Yeah. And the, the a, question the, being asked is, yeah. is, are we making a better decision using a model? I mean, that's the gist of the, of the matter. Okay. So that's just a history lesson. We'll come back to that. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. This is just a, a perspective piece we wrote saying it's kind of important to pay attention to this. That's basically what this says. All right. So now <clears throat> let's look at that specific example, instantiating Megan, can this. Can I interrupt with a question? Yeah. So with respect to ROC, there, there are times where you may want to, uh, because you're balancing the disutility of false negatives and false positives, you may not choose a point that's kind of furthest up and to the left, you might choose mm -hmm. one that, you know, favors high specificity or high sensitivity would be elsewhere on the curve, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the blue line was just an example. The point is we would have to pick a certain cutoff point, a threshold at which we're gonna start taking those actions. And we would have to draw the utility line, the indifference line passing through that point and ask ourselves, is that sufficient for our use case? Is that level of utility good enough? Okay, so now, <clears throat> so all of this was sort of marinating in our heads, uh, at which point we, we were also in parallel building a, a predictive model for mortality. Uh, we'd gotten down on that path because of a couple of collaborations uh, with uh, our colleagues at Sutter, um, we had a PhD student, actually Andrew Ng's PhD student, who had worked with us to build a deep neural net for predicting mortality, got a lot of press around it. But then we said, how are we going to put this to use? And turns out that the label that I really need is, will the patient benefit from advanced care planning? But I don't have that label. And the reason I need that label is that in the US, the majority of people are offered conversations about advanced care planning too, too late. Median is like two, three days before they pass. And it's offered to too few people. So that's the thing we're trying to fix. We want to improve advanced care planning. But to build a model for will this patient benefit or not benefit from advanced care planning, what I really need is a bunch of records that are labeled as will benefit or will not benefit, but I don't have those. So we're going to cheat. We're going to pick a surrogate. And the assumption we're making is that a person who is likely to die is likely to benefit from advanced care planning. Now it's an assumption. We've got to be very upfront about that. So we have a patient timeline. <clears throat> we have a time at which we're making a prediction, that time being the second day or first and second day of their uh, uh, hospitalization. We have some prior medical record. Uh, that's the observation window. And you know, given the idiosyncrasies of IT, we actually get out of the 33 tables that contain all of their observations, we get some of them, seven of them at, in the morning. We make a preliminary prediction. We get backfill the other tables at night, 11 p.m. And second day, we make another prediction, which is more accurate. And both times a prediction being made is a category assignment that is this person likely to die in the next three to 12 months. So good performance, good AURC, good AUPRC. So that's nice. We actually have three models, um, lots of press uh, saying that we're using a deep neural net to predict mortality and, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but actually none of the press actually mentioned the true use case, which is to improve advanced care planning. 
So then before we go and deploy things in the hospital, we got to validate the surrogate label. Because as I told you, it was an assumption that predicting mortality is somehow useful to find people who will benefit from advanced care planning. So we turned on the model in silent mode. It runs every night, makes a prediction. We don't tell anybody. But we partnered with the people uh, in the palliative care division. And then two humans, Stephanie Harmon and Heather Shaw, would, re would review charts of all the people that were admitted at a certain time, in a, in a certain time duration. And then we compared that what they deemed as will benefit from advanced care planning, will it match what the model says? And very high agreement uh, in that. So now I can't under, uh, underscore more the importance of validating your surrogate labels. Next Tuesday, Ziad is probably gonna talk to you about the importance of label choice. And if you get label choice wrong, you can, you can make a lot of mistakes. And especially if you're using a surrogate label, you have to validate it prospectively. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so now seems like we can find uh, the people that might benefit. So the second thing to do, if we want an honest assessment of benefit is to establish a baseline. So this is, the, this is where the bar is right now. The model being used is a single variable, number of admissions. And if it is greater than three, the person would be offered advanced care planning. It's a heuristic, but it is a model in the abstract sense of the word. And it flags 21% of the cases that would have truly benefited as determined by human review. Okay, so that's, we know where the bot is. So now we're gonna plunk in our fancy neural net. In fact, the one that runs is a random forest, but that's okay. Uh, so we need to know what's gonna happen. We're going to increase the workflow by 69%. Now, anytime you go to a doctor and say, I'm gonna increase your work by 70%, <laughs> you gotta be really careful to justify why is that a good idea. So we also quantified the expected benefit saying, at right now, using the heuristic at 21% recall, you actually have to rummage through about two and a half charts to find your one good case, even after the heuristic is applied. So if we're okay with 21% recall, and you use the model to do your case identification, you will have to review just one chart and it'll most likely be correct. So your chart rummaging will be cut out. Alternatively, if you're okay rummaging through two, two and a half charts to find one good case, we can increase recall to 84%. So that's the conversation to have. All right, so then if you wanna increase recall to 84%, well, that is gonna increase your workflow, right? So you, you gotta get buy-in to, to that. <clears throat> and hold on, what happened? There's a missing slide. Give me just one second. Oh, it's just out of order. There we go. So here's the workflow that I've been talking about. The model is gonna be placed in this red box. The workflow has 21 steps, seven handoffs, 48 hours. Um, so it's really important to map out this whole process because your model might be functioning perfectly, but if the workflow fails at one of these orange diamonds, for example, orange uh, 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 spots in the workflow, you're not gonna get any net benefit. And that's, that's quite important uh, to, to be aware of. All right, so we've already gone through this part. So then now we're trying to assess utility. Again, this, this is all in silico, right? We haven't really, I mean, we've deployed stuff. The model's running, it's producing a number, but we're not telling anybody anything yet. And so we're gonna answer four questions. We're gonna ask, is there utility given cost and benefit? Uh, what is the effect of the delivery factors as in all of those other steps in the workflow? What are the trade-offs amongst the different delivery factors? And that's a really good one. And then finally, given work capacity, how much of the utility are we gonna realize? So <clears throat> here's the answer to the first question. The same sort of utility table. Now it has numbers put in, in terms of dollars. These are from a randomized control trial uh, uh, and then inflation adjusted for today's cost. So net, net, we're spending about 3,300 bucks to save 8,400 bucks. That's the deal. 
And this is what the ROC curve and all of the, the you know, follow up on everybody, follow up on nobody. So in this case, we can prove quantitatively that if you don't offer advanced care planning, that's bad. If you try to offer it to everybody, that's also bad because it's very counterproductive. Most people don't need it, you're just wasting effort. Uh, all right, so already looked at the workflow. So the delivery factor. So what I mean by those delivery factors. Uh, so table two uh, on the left is sort of an example of a few of them. The first one is uh, something we just labeled failure rate, like, you know, dog ate the homework, you know, whatever reason we couldn't complete the workflow and conduct ACP. So it's a catch-all. And we vary that from the range of 10% to up to 30%. Then the second one is daily capacity. Uh, we're staffed for about three when we did the simulation, but we could vary that between one and five. The time it takes, I told you in the previous slide, it's 48 hours, so that's two days, but maybe we can do it in a day, and maybe sometimes it takes four days. And then the third, the last row is an interesting one. We say, what if we don't do anything in the inpatient setting? Like, yes, our goal is to improve ACP, but nowhere did we say we have to do it in the inpatient setting, right? We could do it outpatient. So what if we just flag people and then follow up with them uh, at, at a, a subsequent visit? And then we, so that's why the, the default value is not applicable. And then we varied the range between zero to 100% just to explore. So this was set up as a simulation. We simulated 500 days of patient flow through the health system. And you would run the model and then like literally walk through that workflow with certain failure rates at every step. And this particular plot we're looking at is just looking at the <clears throat> capacity constraints, which is the second row here. And we're going away from cents and dollars. So everything is now normalized to 100%, as in the best is 100%. And then what fraction of the theoretical best can you get to? So like not to get too hung up on the, on the dollars. So on the x-axis, the two bookends, the leftmost is treat all. The rightmost is the most optimistic scenario, as in model makes no mistakes, and you follow up on all the true positives, no drop off, what's the best case utility you can get, that's the 100%. So that's the optimistic. And then we ask, if you follow up with one person, two person, three, four, five, what fraction of the 100% do you get? So just one gets you close to 50. And then if you're following up with four to five people, like you're right up here. So that's nice. <clears throat> and then the second one is this final row, uh, the impact of the outpatient rescue. So this particular one, again, optimistic is every person that we flagged, we follow up with them later. Here, we follow up with everybody, so not very effective. And turns out that if we capture only half of the people that were flagged in the outpatient setting, we can get to 75% of the max utility possible. That's a pretty good thing. So we then explored this for all of the other factors and some of their interactions as well. Uh, it's, bas it's basically a simulation. And this is figure one, table two. These are straight from the paper. All right, the last analysis we, uh, sorry, the second last analysis we, uh, we did then is to ask for the trade-offs. So this is a weird looking plot. So let's see, uh, let me walk you through it. So here is my, let's say inpatient capacity is two right now. And the question I'm asking is if I increase my capacity from seeing two patients to three patients, what happens to my per patient utility? Now per patient utility appears to go down, but you get it for two people, right? So here, let's say whatever this was, you multiply that by two, whether you multiply this by three, that number is still larger. So this plot is not very intuitive. It feels like it is going down, but it's still going up. So this is where you increase capacity inpatient uh, gets you. But <clears throat> the thing to notice here, is that if I have outpatient capacity of seeing just two people, I'm already above the inpatient two. And if I'm already at inpatient two here, and if I can go to outpatient three, so I increase capacity, but I increase capacity in the outpatient side, 
not only get I get a, not only do I get more total utility, my per patient utility is also higher. So the gist of this plot was taking action in the outpatient setting was always better in the sense that it was always above anything you could have done inpatient. So we were hoping for these lines to cross, but hands down, trying to do this in the outpatient setting is better. Okay, and then the last plot, figure three in the, in the paper, is trying to answer the question, what is the realized utility given our work capacity? So what we have here on the x-axis is just probability going from one to zero. This, this, this uh, histogram style plot actually <clears throat> is how many patients had a probability of exactly this? So there was one patient with a probability of whatever this is, 0.98. There were eight people with this and 30 people above 0.5 and you know 80 people above point whatever 12 that comes here and 100% by the time we get here. Okay, so it's just the rank order of the, uh, of the predictions. And then we're asking that as we take action on one person, two people, three people, eight people, and so on, what is happening to our uh, poor patient uh, utility? And as you can see, it's going up. And ideally, we would want to be taking enough action so that we are like somewhere here, okay? Now, given that about eight to 10 people get admitted every day, you know, that's like about four or five people, give or take. Our actual capacity is this much. So we're not quite optimal. Remember it was two at that point. So we're somewhere in this range. So, but it's still pretty darn good. I mean, it's in terms of the difference, it's not too far up from, from the optimal. Now, this particular plot, I wouldn't put too much stock in it because it's quite sensitive to your exact utility values. And if you change a, a few numbers here and there, the shape could change. But by and large, we're not quite optimal, but we're close enough. And if we were to increase capacity just a little bit, we'd be there. That's sort of the take home. All right, so that's basically the walkthrough through this framework that I laid out. Uh, what I walk you through is this particular paper about assessing the utility, designing the deployment. This thing is now deployed and Ron Lee is doing the in uh, prospective evaluation to see that by doing this machine learning enabled triggering of the advanced care planning workflow, are we changing the rates of advanced care planning, which is what we truly want to do. All right, so that's basically the walkthrough through the paper. I have one more slide which I can uh, go to or we can just go over straight to questions. Why don't you go ahead with your last slide, Nigam, and then we'll take some questions. All right, so the last slide is following the same color coding. So blue, yellow, green, red, corresponding to the different phases of this delivery science as we're calling it. And one of the students working with us, Jonathan Liu, who's a medical student, sort of reviewed a whole bunch of what I jokingly call proclamations, you know, thou shall dec decrees that say, you should do this in order to do good science or to do uh, good work. So there's 12 such proclamations that say, in order to build good machine learning derived models for clinical medicine, you shall do whatever, X, Y, Z. So across all of these 12, there's something like 300, like 295 or 300 different you know, statements or recommendations. So the poor guy read all of them. <laughs> Uh, deduplicated them, and we're left with about 180 or so atoms or 180 recommendations, which are a union of all of these. And then we asked, is each of those recommendations such that it tells us anything about what to do about the use case assessment, the model formulation, or the utility assessment and whatnot? And then does it actually tell us how to do it, as in provide instructions? Or does it just say it's important and you should somehow do it? And the plot we're looking at, uh, the table we're looking at is basically filling that out. And as you can see, there's a few recommendations, one, two, three, four, five, six of them, 
that do say you should do something about utility. But no one tells you exactly how. There's a lot of recommendations on the deployment side, as you can see with the filled out cells, a lot of chatter on how should you formulate your model. Not as much on fairness, because it's kind of new, there's only two recommendations. And this stuff is practically blank. Now we found out about this after we did the work. So that was kind of bad because <laughs> if we had known this would have made a big deal about it, but we couldn't because we did this work after uh, doing, that, uh, doing that project. All right, so that's the last slide. Here's a whole bunch of related research papers. And what I walked you through was this particular one. Uh, and I made references to these two. And that's it. That's, I'll stop here, take questions.